Hello, everyone. Hello, Texas, Hollywood, Newcastle, Geelong, Cronulla, Florida, Gosford, Birchgrove, Canberra, Margaret River. Hi, everyone. It's a very windy day in Sydney. You may every now and then hear the wind in the background. And this is exciting. It's our first uh, advanced webinar in a few months, and it's about one of my favorite topics. Before we start, I just wanted to make sure you can hear me. Can you all hear me? That's always the challenge at the beginning of um, these webinars. Is the microphone connecting through properly? Or at least this? Yes, good, excellent. It means we can get started. All right. So. How's this going to work? Um, I'm going to do some screen sharing here. Yeah. And um, all right, hang on. So as I um, indicated when I uh, launched the, the the email, POV is a is a ridiculously important topic, and I'm I'm very pleased to see um, over fifty people online now and 59 actually still going up so you probably understand that um, you can learn something from this session now this is go going to be a com compact session a condensed um, session of, of, of a, a class I normally teach over the course of a whole day um, POV is one of three issues that I consider being the the main culprits of films that don't work or scripts that don't work in the first place. It's a poor prom premise, that's concept, a problematic POV, that's what we talk about today, and passive protagonist. Sometimes they hang together and, and people are familiar with my approach of character events and actions, understand how that is all integrated. I did a webinar on that um, a few months ago, and you can still find it in our little shop of webinars. Now, this webinar is also available as a podcast on iTunes. So I apologize in advance for those who are listening. Uh, you may miss out because obviously you can't see the slides and there will be some video material in the course of this uh, webinar as well. So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about point of view and look at a number of aspects of uh, POV. There is, you'll be surprised how many aspects that there are to it, how you can approach it, how you can manage it, how you can control it, and how you can go miserably wrong. So there, there are two types of point of view I'll indicate. I'll explain why it's so important. We'll talk about point of view in other art forms. Um, point of view in adaptation, that's a big one. Exceptions to the rules. I'm not going to invite you to follow those blindly, obviously show you uh, a, a beautiful POV failure. I'll mention, if you have time, something about POV cheating. Most importantly, I'll tell you how to control it, how to manage POV in your screenplay. We'll say something, an anecdote about uh, Michael Haig's mistake in a Sydney workshop. I'll explain shifting POV. That's a, an important skill to master, because ultimately that's really what it comes down to. Pixar use point of view to their benefit. And I'll also show you how Brad Bird learned, learned a thing or two about POV. There's an ebook, and I'll offer that ebook at the end of this um, webinar. It goes a little bit deeper into what I'll be discussing. It'll cover a few more things as well. Obviously, there'll be question time, and I'll also say a few words about the immersion screenwriting course. Some of you are doing that uh, right now, and others may be interested in taking that course in the future. So you may have read in a screenplay or you may have written in a screenplay something along the lines of this, POV Jack, and then you describe what Jack sees. Jack is our main character. Now, most of the time when I read this, it's actually unnecessary because you'll learn if you pay attention, if you really study POV, you'll see that most stories are told from the POV of the main character throughout. So there's no need to specify that. There are situations where you must, specifically when 
to make that moment work, to make that scene work, you shift out of the POV of another of the main character into another character, and you want the camera to take the place of the eyes of that character. But typically, there's no need to do this because you'll always have uh, the point of view of the main character. That brings us to a distinction between two types of POV. When you write this in a screenplay, POV, the monster, for instance, we effectively mean camera point of view. The camera will take the place of the eyes of that character. The second type of POV is dramatic point of view. And that's what we'll be talking about today. That is what concerns us the most. And that's what we need to be aware of 99% of the time. Now, Years ago, to be uh, precise, in the 1940s, 1947, Warner Brothers made a, an amazing uh, discovery. They discovered, they found a way of engaging the audience more than ever before. And it was a truly revolutionary breakthrough, similar to the introduction of sound uh, in movies or the moving camera, or you know, if you want to look at... Um, Today's films, 3D. Now, 3D is maybe a bit more of a hype, and maybe that camera point of view ID was a little bit of a hype back then as well. Let's have some fun and go back to a trailer for Lady in the Lake uh, from 1947, where point of view suddenly becomes um, a selling point. At least that's what they thought. <laughs> Occupation, private detective. You know, somebody says, follow that guy. So I follow him. Somebody says, find that female. So I find her. But some cases, like this one, kind of creep up on you on their hands and knees. And the first thing you know, you're in it up to your neck. Right now, you're reading in your newspapers and hearing over your radios about a murder. They call it the case of the lady in the lake. It's a good title. It fits. What you've read and what you've heard is one thing. The real thing is something else. There's only one guy who knows that. I know it. This lady in the lake business started just three days before Christmas. Who invited you? I, I did. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Marlowe. Just when I was beginning to like you. Well, you want the facts, don't you? When it concerns a woman, does anybody ever really want the facts? Vain female, aren't you? Please don't be so difficult to get along with. I need help. What's going on here? He got cute. Striking an officer, resisting arrest and murder, all on Christmas Eve. Let's wrap you up real pretty, shall we? And take you right down to headquarters. Give me your hand. You'll see it just as I saw it. You'll meet the people, you'll find the clues, and maybe you'll solve it quick, and maybe you won't. You think you will, eh? Okay? You're smart. But let me give you a tip. You've got to watch them. You've got to watch them all the time. Because things happen when you least expect them. No, no, don't! I love you, Rivera! <laughs> Lady in the Lake, 
1947. Warner Brothers got it almost right, but not quite. In fact, they did understand one thing really well. They got it that an audience needs to identify with the main character. What they didn't understand at the time, the, the fundamental mistake was that identification doesn't happen through camera point of view. In fact, it happens through dramatic point of view. And the dramatic point of view is very different. And we'll, we'll talk about the specific techniques to make that happen um, in a minute. So how do we define dramatic point of view? Uh, different people define it in different ways. Uh, I'd say it's the character through whose perspective the story is viewed. So that's the point of view character. So point, when we speak about point of view, it can be a character or it could be the set of tools that you're learning during this hour, during this webinar. A set of techniques used to keep the, stream, the screen audience identified with a character. So the tool that Warner Brothers tried to use was camera point of view, and that is not the way to do it. Um, we'll get to how in a minute. But first of all, why should we care? Why is that identification so important? What, why should we worry about point of view? Well, think about it. We're, today we're talking primarily about cinematic point of view, uh, film, theatrical film. And the experience is very much like a dream. You know, we go into a dark place and we are experiencing a story that is effectively fictitious. It's not happening at this particular point in time, but, it, it, but at some point we forget that we are sitting in that theater and we become part of the story. It, it's almost one-on-one -on -one identification with that main character. That's when stories are the, the strongest, when we have a simulated experience, when we feel the emotions that the character is supposed to feel. And that can only be from one perspective. And when you dream, you only ever dream from your perspective. Now, Obviously, there, there are um, exceptions to that rule or inceptions. Here's um, what I would say is the reason why POV identification is important in cinema. So because of the, the nature of cinema, the audience forgets where they are, even who they are. Sitting in the dark and for the duration of the film, they become the characters on the screen. That's when point of view works. And it's your job as the writer to try and achieve that. Now, Robert McKee said something about point of view as well, and um, in his book, Story, not a lot. He doesn't spend a lot of, in fact, no one really has spent sufficient uh, attention on POV. So that's, that's why I think it's important you do your study yourself. McKee says, the more time spent with a character, the more opportunity to witness his choices. The result is more empathy and emotional involvement between audience and character. You can watch the replay later, by the way, so you don't need to uh, take notes uh, from everything you, you get to see here. So that's uh, Robert McKee's perspective. Now, let's look at how point of view works in different art forms, because today we speak about film. Television is slightly different, because you have more time in TV series to elaborate on a character you can go to other characters and, and still have enough depth of involvement and depth of, of identification. But think about it. Still, many of the really successful uh, TV shows are told primarily from a single perspective. You know, Dexter, Breaking Bad, Mad Men. And it's only when you've created that engagement and you've created suspense and you have that undercurrent of tension that you can go to another character. And mostly that is only for a uh, limited period of time. But as I said, in television, you have greater freedom there. In literature, you probably have the, the greatest freedom. If you think about what types of point of view you'll find, there's obviously the first person, which is the strongest. That's when we identify. It's our story. It's as if the story happens to me. And the, the, the main character of the story tells that story directly to us. So that's the closest involvement. In literature, as in film, you have first person as the most uh, powerful one. Second person is almost non-existent. In my classes, I play a clip. Um, I, I do the, you know, the quiz. What, what art form uses second person more than any other? It's songs, it's love songs. Love songs are directed to the second person. Third person is more common in uh, literature, fiction, not so much in film. It does exist 
when you have a narrator telling the story about our main character. But very often we go back to the main character to identify um, in the first person. Now, third person omniscient, I'm not going into this. That's something you should read in the ebook. It's non existent. Um, and I, I will briefly touch up, uh, on it in the context of my Michael Haig anecdote and, and Die Hard. But if anyone tells you that their story is uh, omniscient, then please ignore that because they don't know what they're talking about. Shifting point of view, that's what you need to. Uh, be aware of because that's the technique that allows you to go from one character to the next and then we will identify with that next character in the first person now while you watch a presentation feel free to um, post questions and i see that uh, some people ha already have the best way to do it is to use the question option so in the chat frame at the bottom of your page you can just post a, a message or ask a question if you select uh, where this is a text bubble you see a little triangle if you click on that you have the option to ask questions um, if you're trouble if you have trouble with your connection with your bandwidth you can do two things you can reconnect just reset at the bottom uh, of your page there in the center there should be an option to do that or you can just wait for the replay and that usually goes smoother um and ask the question how can you address the problem of a passive protagonist passive protagonist is unrelated to point of view it is completely well it is it's unrelated in the sense that when you have a passive protagonist you'll be more inclined to move out of the point of view of that character simply because that character is no longer uh, very interesting but it is a it is a separate issue uh, altogether so shifting point of view is it's the most interesting one and we'll talk about that and then finally there is this really um bizarre uh, no, so first dramatic irony. It's a, it's a, that's an example of shifting point of view. But then finally, um, I call it the Kaufman point of view. Uh, Charlie Kaufman, he uh, plays with point of view in being John Malkovich. And the title suggests, you know, John Cusack's character becomes John Malkovich. And we shift from Cusack to the character of Malkovich. And then there's, um, there's a few other characters. He shifts. He keeps shifting effectively. And you know where we end up? That's when um, some people may lose the story or Kaufman may lose his audience. Well, have a, have a look what happens in that film. It's Charlie Kaufman's being John Malkovich and he plays with point of view to the point where it becomes quite absurd. Some people will go with it, others won't. Be, be aware of that. And asks the question, the point of view of the story should be that of the protagonist, but can it also be the POV of the antagonist? And what about multi-POV in a story when multiple characters drive the theme of the story? Good question. And I think the at the end of this webinar you will have the answer to that um the short you know the short response would be if you would if you were to take the point of view of the protagonist you you are in atas territory i have an example where that happens but it's very unusual and you will reduce your audience you will significantly limit your audience multi pov doesn't work quite as well 
uh, and I, I would call it shifting POV because multiple point of view is impossible. You cannot at the same time be in the POV of more than one character. So if you look at a film like Crash, that is an exception. There's only one Oscar winner who's ever achieved that. And don't forget, Paul Haggis had 20 years of experience in television before he wrote that screenplay. And in television, is uh, shifting POV is quite, quite uh, common. So that's a, that's the brief answer. Adaptation. Now, I'm not talking about the the movie by uh, Charlie Kaufman, or written by Charlie Kaufman, but uh, we'll get to that one later. What if you adapt a book, a novel that is written from several perspectives? And maybe that's that is Anne's question or part of Anne's question. If you want to tell a multi protagonist story or a multi protagonist novel, you want to bring that to the screen. The sanest thing to do would be to pick one perspective and tell that story, retell that story from one point of view. And that's what the greatest adaptations have always done. The greatest screenwriters do that and do that quite well. Um, if you look at a few titles, you know, One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest was effectively uh, told from the chief's perspective, but that was difficult because he, you know, we could go into his thoughts in the, in the novel, but the same cannot be achieved on the screen, and therefore, can um, uh, Milos Forman chose to tell the story from McMurphy's perspective, and then obviously in the frame story we we come back. That was that was very successful. Another really successful adaptation was Room with a View. Room with a View, um, the Forster novel from the late um, 1800s, I believe, uh, early 1900s. Adapted by uh, Merchant Ivory, uh, the screenwriter was Ruth Pro Javala, wonderful screenwriter and, and quite an expert at, at literary adaptations. I have a page from the novel here, and let's uh, just have a quick look at that to see what the point of view is in this particular on this particular page. At that supreme moment, he was conscious of nothing but absurdities. Just the phrase "he was conscious" places us in the point of view of the male character, which is Sybil. Uh, she gave such a business-like lift to her veil as, she, as he approached her. He found time to wish, again, firmly in his point of view. Further down, he considered, he recast the scene, he believed that women revere men for their manliness. Is that true? So this page is um, undeniably from Sybil's point of view. Now, those who've seen the film know that um, the room with the view is told from perspective of Lucy, Lucy Honeychurch, and her single point of view. This particular scene, uh, by the way, the, the sacred lake, it's called, we are we get the confirmation of that point of view when there's a short flashback. And flashbacks are the clearest among you know, some dreams is another one or a voiceover, the clearest indication whose point of view we are in. So when you have a flashback in your story, do make sure that that is done from the main character's perspective. I'll give you an example of where someone went wrong and, um, yeah, did it from a different perspective. And that didn't quite work. Uh, I know we're screenwriters. We want to be creative. We want to be different. We don't want to do the way people did it before. So we want to break rules. And for that, we will always argue that there are films that did it differently and did it successfully. And you're absolutely right. There are very successful exceptions. Here's a few. Sicario recently was um, an interesting point of view. It started from Emily Blunt's perspective and then shifted to Benicio Del Toro's. I would argue that um, to tell that same story, you could not stay in either's perspective throughout the film so you need to make a decision if that's your story you're going to either um massacre the story or tell a different story or limit your audience because some people will not like that some people will find that they've invested in this one character and now suddenly we're, we're going to leave that character behind going to a different character so if you want to tell a story that requires you to shift in the course of the story the main perspective then that's that's a different call to make. I think The Prestige was one like that. The movie started from Hugh Jackman's perspective and then gradually shifted to Christian Bale's. At least that was how I experienced it. Shawshank Redemption is slightly different in that you have 
somewhat of a dual perspective. We shift back and forth. One character has what we call the inner journey that's red, who, who learns. And uh, Andy Dufresne, played by uh, Tim Robbins, he is the outer journey hero. He's the, the character who drives the action. Animal Kingdom, I would also categorize as a film that is an exception in terms of point of view because we we leave Jay's perspective at a critical moment, which is the, the inciting incident. And some people will argue that that worked really well. I love the movie, but I do believe that if that story had been told more rigorously from Jay's perspective, it would have been more powerful. Um, but that was probably not Michaud's um, objective. I put Sacco at the bottom of the list because that's that's a wonderful exception where, yes, we do shift into the point of view of the antagonist. And you, you remember what a profound impact that had on the audience. It is it's extraordinary, it's exceptional, and it's not something you should replicate because it worked for this movie because... Hitchcock was doing something really interesting. He was telling the story of a paranoid schizophrenic character and what he really did with the audience was give us that experience. We identified first with um, Marion, Marion Crane, Jenna Lee's character, and then when she was no longer around, we were forced to pick the only character on the screen and that was um, that was Norman Bates. So we, we had to go with Norman Bates at that particular point in time. And then later in that story, uh, we keep shifting. We go to the detective. So there are exceptions. Some of these exceptions are quite successful. But do acknowledge that they are exceptions indeed. You know, it's not something that you should replicate. Um, and as I said, there are there are stories where you you can only do that, but I would say get some experience first. See your stories on the screen before you play with it. David asks, in a buddy movie like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, it's usually uh, two POVs. Now, buddy movies, love stories have that. Uh, sleeping in Seattle, we go back and forth. So love stories essentially have a, not just a dual uh, POV or a shifting POV because you go back and forth, but also uh, a dual protagonist. They're hard to write. They're gruesomely hard to write, and they're not the type of stories I would recommend to beginning screenwriters um, because you need to achieve a similar level of involvement and identification with each character, only you have only half of the time. Not easy. Um, yeah, that's that scene in Psycho where we see the car uh, go down into the swamp and then stop. Norman Bates wants to get rid of the evidence, but then the car doesn't disappear and he worries. And we feel his fear and we want it to disappear with him. So we are, at that point, identified with the antagonist. So, and um, it is possible, but these, um, yeah, these instances are quite exceptional. Interesting failures. Um, and to, to show you on, I need to change my... Um, presentation here and while I do that I'll play another interesting point of view um, clip let's see which one I've got a few videos lined up here um, yes let's I, I spoke about Charlie Kaufman and adaptation and I'm now running ahead on one of the techniques to place your audience firmly in the POV of the character. Let me be clear, this is not a failure, although Robert McKee says you should not uh, use voiceover because it's lazy screenwriting. This is definitely not a failure. Not I am failure. pathetic. I am a loser. So, what is the substance of writing? I have failed. I am panicked. First, I have sold out. I am worthless. Last, I, uh, what the fuck am I doing here? The what the fuck am I doing here? Fuck! It is my weakness, story. my ultimate lack of conviction that brings me here. Easy answers, rules to shortcut to yourself to success. To and here I am, because my jaunt into the abyss brought me nothing. Well, isn't that just the risk one takes for attempting something new? I should leave here right now. I'll start over. I need to face this project head on and... and God help you if you use voiceover in your work, my friends. God help you. It's flaccid, sloppy writing. Any idiot can write voiceover narration to explain the thoughts of a character. 
Okay, that's it. One hour for lunch. Okay, that was shorter than I'd expected. Um, I was just lining up the rest of the um, presentation. And uh, we're going to the techniques that you use or in fact to to keep your audience into the or in, in the pov of your main character and after that we'll go to shifting pov um but failures of course that's where we were let's let's look at an interesting failure um in fact when i prepared for this webinar quite a while ago as you do you google and i googled this phrase Film, same story from different perspective. And that's what you wanted, isn't it? So what did Google give me? It gave me Vantage Point. And there's a, um, there's a little review of that film. And I want to share that with you. Here we go. So maybe... You should hold off on that idea of multiple point of view for just a while and focus on your single point of view. The techniques, they're quite simple. And they're, oh yes, sorry, if, if you couldn't read the, the type of rain, I'd say watch the replay, um, it's worth it. The techniques are quite simple, but it requires discipline and the first one this is the most important one keep your main character on the screen that is that's the number one thing they must be in the scene they must be on the screen why do they need to be on the screen because we need to see their eyes and that was the big mistake warner made in, in 1947 with lady in the lake when you do a camera point of view you cannot see the eyes of that character it's absolutely critical and it sounds counterintuitive you know because if you want to experience something you want to see what that character sees in film it is different in film you need to see the eyes of that character it's, it's much much more powerful than, than camera point of view so the, i say th those two stick to those two and you're halfway there so keep your character on the screen and make sure we see their eyes so we understand their reaction to every story beat we also need to understand their goals. It turns out that we are all goal-oriented people, uh, creatures, and we identify more easily with a character that has goals, that has clear goals, that has strong goals. So if, if you have your goals clearly defined, and th th that is an essential point for screenwriting anyway, that will help the identification. Secrets is another one. If we share a secret with a character, the identification is going to be much easier. Um, put the character in jeopardy, it'll be easy to feel the fear, to feel the suspense through the point of view, through the perspective of that character. Now, questions, I might, I should put uh, as number three, really, because questions are super powerful. When a movie opens, we have questions. We have questions about the world. We have questions about the characters. When these uh, characters on the screen express those questions for us we identify with them and the immersion screenwriting students know uh if they i forgot which screenplay it was um I'll look that up quickly one of the scripts had a, a question it's uh, script number six in the screenwriting in the uh, immersion screenwriting course has a question about just this and um, I'm, I'm, I'll give the answer if, if you're not to script six yet and you're on this webinar. Well, the question was, the main character, the, the lines of the 50 or more than 50% of the lines of the main character in that movie are something. And they're all questions. And I, I won't give away which movie it is. It's a, it's a big movie. Uh, but you can probably Google that again. So in, in big movies, a lot of the lines of the main characters are questions. Now, th there can be another aspect to that in, um, in Inception. Um, Nolan made a decision to move away from the character of Don Cobb and have the questions, the expositionary questions asked by a, a supporting character. 
I didn't think that was very effective because we felt the connection with Don Cobb slipping and we went into the point of view of Emma Page's character, Ariadne. That's how powerful questions are. They force us in the point of view of that character. So have that character ask the questions that we, the audience, have and you will manage to keep us uh, or get us into that point of view. And then finally, you saw the example from adaptation. Voiceover is another super powerful way of um, creating identification with a character. So that's uh, these are the techniques. I wanted to tell a bit about shifting POV because you won't stick to my advice and you will want to go to the point of view of a different character. Okay, I'll help you to understand when and where you can do that. There's really three main reasons why you would do that. First one is mystery. It's not necessarily the biggest one or the most important one. If you want to create um, a sense of mystery or uncertainty about what you see is real or not, you can shift to an unreliable character. In the murder mystery, Laura, there's a whole sequence told from the perspective of one of the suspects. He tells the story, we go into his point of view, we stay in, in his point of view, we experience what he tells the detective as if we were experiencing it. But we don't know whether it actually happened. So there's mystery there. More importantly, dramatic irony. It's used all the time. In short moments in every film, we move away briefly from the main character to get information that has an impact on our main character, that puts our main character in jeopardy. Usually, you know, often it's about danger. You know, we see um, a hidden gun um, or we see a letter or we see a, a piece of information that the main character doesn't have, but that we have the audience. So when you have a discrepancy between what we know and what the audience, what, sorry, what the main character knows, we call that dramatic irony. It's a term coined by Frank Daniel. And finally, comedy. I would say, Almost every comedic moment in a film, if it's not a line of dialogue, if the, the comedy is not in the dialogue, if, the, if it's a situation, there will be a third person looking at the two characters between uh, who that uh, situation plays out. Um, John Cleese defined comedy as not to people doing funny things or, or not us looking at people doing funny things, but it is somebody looking at somebody doing something funny. Um, I'm very bad at paraphrasing here, but if you want to, the, the proper definition, go to Steve Kaplan. His book, The Tools, The Hidden Tools of Comedy, dedicates a whole chapter to what he calls the straight line, wavy line. Now, I do have a, a, a little clip, and it's probably my favorite example of today, and I'm praying that YouTube will allow me to play it because I've uploaded these clips to YouTube and sometimes they are blocked for reasons of copyright but most studios allow you to play it as long as you you know let uh, commercials play out so you should see it without commercial this example is from three movies I'll quickly introduce them first one is stranger than fiction an example of third person narrative so third person, um, not really point of view. The film opens with the narration by um, Emma Thompson, and she tells the story of Harold Crick, and he is the main character. So soon after that, we go to into his point of view. Now, the, the scene you're going to see is an example of shifting point of view for comedy. He will be talking to the writer, to God in the sky, and we understand that because... The whole film has followed that concept that his story is being written as the movie plays out. That is not funny in itself. But when we have other characters look at it, other characters see him behave this way, then it, be it becomes fun funny. My students know I've also played the clip from The Incredibles quite a bit. End of The Incredibles, Dash has now learned to control his running, his speeding, and he's running a race and his parents are yelling at him to become second not first to run to become second and there's this guy sitting next to them who 
doesn't quite understand what's going on. We get it. We totally get what's going on because we've seen the story. But this guy doesn't get it. So it's it's funny. And you'll see how we cut back to that point of view. It's a shifting point of view, brief shifting point of view to create that comedy. And the, the last example, if you think uh, this is the best example of shifting point of view, you might guess which one that uh, will be. Here we go. Thus, Harold's watch thrust him into the immitigable path of fate. Little did he know that this simple, seemingly innocuous act would result in his imminent death. What? What? Hey! Hello? What? Why? Why my death? Hello? Excuse me? When? How imminent? I'll have what she's having. That moment in When Harry Met Sally only works because we shift to that other woman. And that's where the comedy comes in. So shifting point of view to create comedy, um, to create dramatic irony, and to create mystery. Dramatic irony can be summarized in one sentence, in fact. Um, Sorry, we, yeah, um, we, we've seen these mystery, dramatic irony, comedy. Dramatic irony is when you read little did he know, because we know, the reader knows, the viewer knows, but the character does not. Let's go to Pixar. If you want to learn about storytelling, um, go to Pixar, see how they do things. Michael Arndt spoke about point of view uh, when they were working on Toy Story 3. He had a problem introducing the inciting incident. And in this little clip, he explains how he used point of view to solve that problem. Now, again, my warning, my, my typical warning, don't try this at home because these guys are experienced is another example of shifting point of view. You want to set, establish the threat that the toys may get thrown out, basically. That has to, because that's what happens to them, so that threat needs to be established or foreshadowed ahead of time. And so I was writing this incredibly clunky dialogue between Andy and his mom in which he says, oh, Andy, you better watch it. That, those toys may get thrown out or something like that. And there was no way that you could bury that foreshadowing or bury that exposition without it just feeling totally obvious and clunky. And so I couldn't figure this out. And there was a, um, a fire drill at uh, Pixar. And uh, you know, the, the bell goes off and we all walk out on the front lawn. And we're all just kind of sitting there, and I'm standing next to, to Andrew, and just sort of as a way of making a conversation, I was like, I don't know how to foreshadow the fact in a, in, in, in a hidden way that the toys may get thrown out. And I keep writing this clunky dialogue, and he immediately goes, oh, don't do it from, because he had written the first Toy Story film, so he's used to thinking in these terms. He says, don't tell the story from the human's point of view, tell it from the toy's point of view. Have some toy who's like, Guys, Andy's grown up, I'm getting out of here. And that's what turned into the toy soldiers going, you know, when the trash bags come out, we army guys are the first to go, you know, and they jump ship. And so Andrew was like, you know, show that, that threat from a toy's point of view and show a couple of guys freaking out and like, we can't take it, the pressure anymore, we're out of here. So that was, that, and, and like, I would have never, you know, I was trying to figure that out for, for a couple of weeks and then just a casual conversation just because everyone's there in that building solved that problem. And we're back. I've been keeping an eye on the questions um, and your chat. Yeah. Simon says, Michael Arndt is king. Absolutely. And Les says, don't tell us not to try it at home. We should try it. So we find out how to do it properly. The problem with that is that you only see it when, it ha when it's on the screen. You only know whether it works or not. That's, that's just... Um, that's just the thing. Your own material, it's very hard to judge it on the page. You need to see it play out on the screen to understand um, 
how and whether it works. I have another example from Pixar, and this is um, one of my favorites. And it you know, it shows again how much you can learn from looking at director's commentary. This one is from Brad Bird. He is an outstanding filmmaker. Um, well, until he did, uh, what was it, Tomorrowland. But he's he's got a quite impressive track record ranging back from The, um, the Simpsons to uh, The Iron Giant, uh, Ratatouille, The Incredibles. Um, he also did one of the Mission Impossible movies. Now, he understands story and he's learned things the hard way. Well, you know, maybe he was protected by the studio. I'll show you two deleted scenes from two different films he made with an interval of eight years. The Iron Giant was his first directorial uh, animated, animated feature and he had to cut a scene. The studio, Warner Brothers, didn't want to animate the scene of the giant's dream. And it makes sense because the story is not the giant's story. It's the story of Hogarth. Hogarth is the point of view character. So by definition, you shouldn't go into the point of view of the of the giant. Now they figured their way around it, but you know, that sort of workarounds don't always work. And and Warner Brothers didn't want to run the risk. And I think they were absolutely right. Now, eight years later, Brad Bird had learned and in his um, next animation, the uh, Ratatouille was not his next, he did uh, Crabs in, in, in the meantime, but he had learned about point of view and he explains why he cut out a scene this time around. So it was not the studio, he decided um, to take it out himself. So first you'll hear him talk about that scene that was cut out of uh, the Iron Giant is a little bit bitter about it. And then we see just a small part of the scene from Ratatouille that never made it into the film. And then you'll hear his commentary and he explains why he cut that out. It's a very intriguing scene. There's nothing else like it in the movie in that it's kind of abstract. Uh, I think the notion of the giant's uh, 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 dream actually being electronically sent out as a signal to the point where it appears on Dean's television is a really intriguing idea. You know, the giant is struggling with this concept of life and death in the sequence, and he, he, he starts remembering. It sort of jogs his memory. And he starts sort of these images from his real past, the things that he was made to do start coming to him in the dream. That's one that I would have liked to have made all the way through because I think it would have been a really cool piece of filmmaking. But uh, uh, again, I think the film works fine without it. I just think it would have been a little bit better with it. I think the natural question that would occur is why would you cut this spectacular shot? Because it's obviously great and, you know, I want to see that film, you know? Uh, well, I feel that way too. The problem is that uh, once you get past the initial sort of rush of seeing this very elaborate shot that shows you a lot of different things in one shot and very impressively, is that it, it is no character's point of view. It is just a sort of godlike shot where you're, you're presented this whole world, and it is spectacular, and there have been many fine shots like that, Touch of Evil being one, uh, that uh, uh, work great. But I felt that this was Remy's movie, and it needed to be Remy's perspective. And I want to know the emotions that lead up to uh, Remy looking into the kitchen. I don't just want it laid on a platter. You don't just cut to uh, Darth going, you're my son, Luke, you know? I mean, uh, that's, we, should, we should be with Remy when he has that moment, and we should know how he's experiencing it and what is he feeling when he experiences it. And you kind of aren't this way. It did lay everything out, but I don't think that it took the audience with it. It is so worth um, checking out those 
director's commentaries or writer's commentaries. I really, really recommend if you want to learn about filmmaking, check out deleted scenes. Um, in fact, I did a little bit of research on that as well. And uh, may, some of you may know or like the TV series, Mr. Robot. And if you look at um, the deleted scenes in the first season, I think there's only two that are made available. And one of them is not from the point of view of the main character. So even in television every now and then, um, you know, the, the filmmakers or the, 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 the producers decide to take out scenes that are not clearly focused from the main character's perspective. Um, good, we're uh, rapidly approaching the end of this webinar. Um, and yep, I'm going to have to leave the anecdote about Michael Haig for another time. Uh, you could read that in the ebook. I'll say a few things about that in a minute. Now, before we finish, make sure you post your questions. I'm going to look at your questions in a second. Um, I have mentioned that ebook a couple of times. I always give something special to the uh, attendance of my live webinars. And I wanted to offer you not just the ebook, but the ebook together with the webinar, the, the, the premium version of the webinar, um, which will be available in the little shop of webinars where things rapidly increase in price. If you go there, you look at previous webinars, they're, they're all around 39 to 79 dollars. This one will soon be there for 39. I'm offering it to you for nine dollars. So if you want to pre-order the full pack, you can get it now for nine dollars only. Um, what's the premium webinar? Well, when you saw me look away from the camera, I was actually looking into a slightly higher resolution camera. So I do a, a proper edit of this webinar afterwards and upload that. And you can access that as part of this pack that you can get now for $9, later for $39. And, and some of these go up to $79, as I said. Um, I, if you're interested in other webinars, I'll post a link to those in the next email. So let's have a look at the questions. Where are we? Yes. Questions. Lois says, adapting a story with time travel and nine main characters, I should maybe leave for a while. Lois, nothing to worry. You are a television writer. Time travel and nine main characters, perfectly possible. But uh, it's got to go on television. And just instead of making two hours, make it 50 hours or 200 hours. Remember Battlestar Galactica? Marina says, oh man, I'm sure this is a hugely basic question. How is POV shown in a screenplay? By showing what the main character is doing. No, Marina, this is a brilliant question. In fact, I should have addressed it and I was planning on addressing it. So thank you for reminding me. How do you address POV in a screenplay? Well, you just start the sentence with the name of your main character. I did an exercise in reverse screenwriting, and uh, the immerse, immersion students will know very soon what uh, reverse screenwriting is, as that's, uh, that's the second stage of that course. Reverse screenwriting is when you write an existing scene into a screenplay. So rather than you know having a script and making the movie, the movie's made, you're going to write the script. I did this exercise, and one of the students, I took the midpoint of uh, Avatar, one of the students wrote um, Colonel Quaritch does this, Colonel Quaritch does that, and he described a whole scene from the perspective of Quaritch. Now, Jake is the main character in Avatar, and in the screenplay, um, James Cameron started each sentence with, with that, you know, Jake um, can't uh, look at his eyes or something, you know, you know, averts his gaze. So you just focus on the main character and tell the story in the active tense using your main character as the subject of your sentence. That's that's how you usually do it. Christina says, there were different point of views in, uh, points of view rather, in Stranger Things. Is that because it's television? Absolutely. This TV and uh, in Stranger Things, there are a number of characters that all compete for, uh, for equal um, prominence, I would say. David says, Fight Club must have been complicated in POV matters. Oh yes, Fight Club's definitely one of those exceptions also because the story is exactly about that it is about that schizophrenic um main character good um so Anne came back on the topic of passive protagonist and i, I think that's good because passive protagonist was one of those key three issues if you remember 
If one of the problems with POV is a passive protagonist, how can you address, fix that, so that the audience can identify with the POV of the main character? Yeah. Give your character goals. Make sure they are pursuing those goals. They're struggling to achieve those goals. And that's usually in Act 2. And it's usually in Act 2 when the writer doesn't know how to keep focus on that main character and then shifts to another character. So it's about keeping your character on the screen, giving them enough to do. And in Canberra for the Accelerator Pod program, I uh, did a session where I mentioned that your main character ideally should be obsessive. If your character is obsessive by nature, they will be active and we will want to be with them and we will want to feel the adrenaline. We will want to be with them as they, um, as they struggle to achieve their goals. Let's see if there are any other questions. Um, you know, the, I'm really only looking at the questions in red on my screen. They're the ones that you've entered separately. Um, I see the other message, but there's so many of them, so it's really tough to find if there's any other questions in there. Um, so Katara says something. Oh, no, that was two lois. Okay. Um, David says, as Brett mentioned, it could be the main character or another character. It just has to be someone's as opposed to just an interesting camera move. Yeah, well, David, um, it in the case of Ratatouille, it was the main character, and it was not by, uh, by coincidence that it was the main character. You'll find that most, most stories are told primarily from the main character, but you're right. You can shift. You cannot have an omniscient uh, point of view because that robs us from emotional engagement. Good. All right. I th uh, Victor has uh, a question. Oh, Christina says, or oh, certainly there's a whole lot of questions. Qatar has a shifting point of view already been done in a biopic. Hmm. Interesting one. Well, if you have a biopic, I would expect to stay with that, with that character that you're telling the story about. But um, you would shift it. All right, here, we got to wrap up very quickly, but, but there's one thing that I'd want to mention is that if, if you want to know when you uh, can shift, it's usually right after a climax, when there is enough tension to keep the audience engaged and wanting to know what's going to happen next. Study um, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest and uh, North by Northwest. Both films are told rigorously from the perspective of a single, uh, from the main character. But there are only one or two moments in the entire film when we shift away from that point of view. And in the case of North by Northwest, that's at the end of Act 1, beginning of Act 2, in uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, that is right after the midpoint. So at the beginning of sequences, at the beginning of Acts, very briefly, once one brief scene at the very most. Victor asks, can you do a webinar on developing a solid premise? Um, very good one, Victor. I will do that. And in fact, I've been planning on doing that. I've, I've been gathering material. Um, I have a class. I have a whole class, a whole weekend on concepts. In fact, I've mentioned the Accelerator pod in Canberra a few times. That's really what that program is all about. It's about developing solid com concepts, solid premises. Sally, that's a final question. So how do you have one person as a narrator and another as the protagonist? How to handle the POV? Good. Well, in fact, you, the, the, the protagonist will be the main POV. Narrator is, is rarely an interesting point of view because the story is about that, that uh, the first person character and we want to experience what, what that person experiences. So the, the, the experiences of the narrator are rarely interesting. Therefore, in the prestige, when the prestige opens with a point of view of the uh, Michael Caine character, the narrator, we go, we very quickly go into Hugh Jackman's character. When um, Strange Than Fiction opens with Emma Thompson's voice as the narrator, very quickly we go into Harold Crick. So you have, um, you have a frame story where the narrator talks, but then the dramatic point of view very quickly becomes the protagonist, single uh, first-person protagonist. I hope that answers your question, Sally. Good. Immersion, um, we don't have much time left. In fact, we have no time left. But what I'll do is I will post a link 
if you want to know what immersion is about there is a facebook group a closed facebook group where you can hang out and you know ask questions and talk with uh, current students and um I'm, I'm hoping i said that i would not do another free immersion course again but i'm still planning on doing one because we, we want to make sure that everything is ironed out before we start the paid courses in 2017 so the chances are that we start another immersion free group on the 1st of november and i will post the link to um that closed group right now uh, and that should be in your the right hand side of your um yeah there we go join immersion for free that's it you'll have that you'll have that before i say it because there's a 30 second uh, 30 second delay between what i said good that was it if you're watching the replay of this webinar you can post questions and they will be added to the chat later if i can i will reply by email so if you're watching the replay and that happens you know it's not live you can still ask questions and they will be answered um, either by email or in the chat if and when i'm live good thanks for joining us um maybe our next advanced webinar will be on developing great concepts who knows thank you for participating today and i hope you'll join us next time again see you either in canberra on Facebook or in the fishbowl.